second session. The next speaker is Agnes Valenti, who will be talking about uh, optimization landscape in neural network quantum states. Please. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much for the introduction, and uh, thanks a lot for the organizers for having me. Um, and I'm excited to be in Trieste, very beautiful weather. <laughs> um, so, okay, I'm going to talk about um, in how to understand a bit better what goes on during training um, if, we, if we use neural network quantum states. But I want to say this is very much work in progress, so I'm not claiming to have, we are not claiming to have any answers yet, but uh, I thought it's nice to talk about it anyway uh, in order to have a productive discussion maybe um, um, about this topic. So this work uh, is done together with a bunch of collaborators, and I think half of them are sitting in the audience right now. So if you have any questions, you can also talk to them. Um, so let's start. Uh, in the previous talk, there was already a very nice introduction into neural network quantum states, which uh, makes my life a bit easier, but I'm going to reintroduce them anyway in order to um, make sure that everybody is on the same page. So what's the problem we're considering? Well, we want to solve a many-body problem. Um, in particular, here we focus on the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So we have a Hamiltonian, and we want to find the ground state wave function of this Hamiltonian and the associated energy to it. And maybe some excited states, but for now let's focus on the ground state energy. Um, now, the problem we have um, is uh, that this, uh, this object, the wave function, scales exponentially with system size. So, we all know that uh, if we go to larger lattice systems, um, then um, we cannot solve the system exactly anymore and we run into problems. Now, luckily, uh, this is not the end of the story, else we all would only build quantum computers. But um, we can look at it in the following way. So if we consider this huge um, exponential Hilbert space, um, what we can think about is that we're not looking to represent just any state in this Hilbert space, but rather some more or less specific submanifold of this Hilbert space, which corresponds to the ground states of physical Hamiltonians. And physical means maybe local, maybe a specific subset of systems uh, that we're interested in. And then the hope is that maybe for the submanifold, we can find some sort of parametrization uh, for it that does not scale exponentially with system size. Um, and then we can make use of the variation principle to optimize this parametrization and find the ground state wave function. So this is basically an idea that has been around for a long time and uh, people have worked on it for a long time um, um, for Basically, it corresponds to the whole field of variational methods. Um, and here we're going to focus on variational Monte Carlo, where uh, basically we don't have uh, a restriction on what sort of parametrization we use um, since we estimate all relevant expectation values with Monte Carlo sampling. Um, and uh, not so recent anymore development was to say, okay, you know, we can use uh, uh, parametrization for this wave function, which is as generic as possible. Because we, we can think about the history of version Monte Carlo, um, and the field started out with very physically motivated wave functions, um, such as uh, uh, Slater, Jastro, Goodswiller projected wave functions, which offer great um, 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 physical insight, but if you use them alone, at least, um, they also come with limited variational freedom. Uh, there is another class of variational methods, not using Monte Carlo, which are tensor networks. Uh, and while they are extremely powerful, we know that their limitations correspond to, are related to um, entanglement. Um, so here the idea was that uh, if we use a very generic parametrization, a neural network, as our variational ansatz, um, maybe we're not as restricted and can go to systems that we cannot address with other methods. Um, and how does it work? Well, we have this neural network. Um, it takes as input a spin configuration. So now I'm just talking about spin systems um, and will output a potentially complex amplitude, um, which then goes into our, um, our wave function since we expand it in some sort of basis, for instance, in uh, Z basis of our spins. Um, now we can relate this problem to classical machine learning. Um, and uh, reframe it a bit and say, okay, 
uh, what we do is we actually minimize a cost function, and the cost function is just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And this cost function, in every step, we estimate using a finite number of samples, which are our Monte Carlo samples. So if we want, we can say, well, that's our training data. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, because what we do is we generate this training data on the go from our neural network. But we can anyway ask the question, okay, you know, maybe there are some connections to classical machine learning. Now, neural network quantum states have had great successes uh, for hard problems where other methods fail. Um, however, hard problems are still hard problems, um, and also neural network quantum states face limitations there. So here just some examples for some more recent or less recent uh, results of neural network quantum states on frustrated systems. And what's typically observed is that while you do get state-of-the-art accuracy, um, the accuracy is uh, at the highly frustrated point is typically quite a bit lower that, than if you're out of frustration. And similarly, you can look at other systems, and not always is it guaranteed that your neural network wave function will find uh, the correct ground state to, let's say, machine precision. Um, and you can ask the question, okay, well, what, what is it that can go wrong during optimization? Um, well, firstly, it could be that our ansatz is just not expressive enough, meaning that it spans some submanifold of the Hilbert space, but it does not contain the ground state. Um, so if that's the case, you would optimize, optimize, but you would uh, end up at a finite distance to the ground state, um, so maybe you just do not have the correct, uh, the correct ansatz. Secondly, you can also think that maybe it is expressive enough, um, but maybe you get stuck somewhere. So maybe your optimization landscape is somehow weird or you don't see it correctly during training because of the finite number of samples um, and you get stuck uh, and you don't manage to get out, um, even though your ansatz in principle would capture the ground state. Um, so that would uh, correspond to issues with trainability. And there has been quite a bit of work on uh, examining what could it be, where are some limitations uh, of these systems, where does the problem lie, um, and the answer so far is maybe everywhere. <laughs> um, so here, the, this is just, there has been a bit of work, these are just some uh, three main papers. Um, 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 the first paper looked at uh, reconstructing um, quantum states of frustrated systems, uh, not by minimizing the ground state energy, but by actually directly minimizing the, the infidelity between the exact ground state for small systems. And what they found is that the network struggles to generalize to the correct ground state uh, for if too little amount of samples is used. So they found actually a critical number of samples that is needed to generalize to the correct state. Then another paper uh, found strong indications that um, um, maybe problems also arise from um, a landscape that is not smooth but rugged uh, in a particular way. Um, and thirdly, this recent paper claims that um, um, the problem might also, one of the problems may also lie in the expressivity because what they see is that if they increase the, uh, the number of parameters, um, um, a lot, then the, the, the effect of expressivity in terms of the Hilbert space does not increase. So what does it tell us? It's a hard problem. Um, you cannot find one single answer, but you can try to understand it a bit better and try to bring things together. So I'm not claiming that we do that yet, but that's uh, what we're trying, trying to look at. Um, and in particular, what we're trying to look at is the following thing. So let's say we have all of these problems, you know, there's expressivity is somehow not good, um, um, your landscape is not smooth, what do you do? And these are problems that do appear in standard machine learning. Um, and one common answer that people have um, is, well, you know, more is better. Um, let's just increase the number of parameters and Samples is a bit more complicated, but let's say, let's just go to an over-parameterized regime. And what you see in classical machine learning typically is this phenomenon that, uh, of what they call double descent, um, which means that in a, what they call classical regime, you uh, increase the number of parameters of your model, your test error and your training error both go down, uh, but at some point you're overfitting and then your test error goes up again. But then, if you 
continue increasing your number of parameters, you go into a new modern uh, interpolating regime where your test error goes down again. And this is where you're like truly modern over-parameterized. Further, people find that if you extremely over-parameterized, then your optimiza optimization landscape gets quite a bit smoother and it's easier to, to optimize your system. Now, for neural network quantum states, that's of course not clear at all what it means. Um, first of all, what is this, uh, what is this threshold uh, after which we can say we're over-parameterized? So is it the number of samples in your Hilbert space? If that's the case, then we can never over-parameterize because we wanted to get rid of the exponential scaling um, in the first place. Or is it maybe a relevant set of subsamples that only occur when you sample from a ground state? That's not clear, um, but we can try to look at this and understand a bit in which regime we are in. Um, second, uh, there is not only a dependence on the number of parameters, but there's also a dependence on the number of samples. Um, and uh, if you look at the total number of samples that you see during training, then a similar statement as for parameters is true, more is generally better. Um, and you might even see also a double descent phenomenon as a function of total number of epochs uh, that you train your model for. Um, however, if you look at the number of samples seen per iteration, then in classical machine learning, um, typically batch size noise helps, meaning training with smaller batches uh, gives you more accurate um, uh, results in the end. And this is also not clear how this, uh, how this translates for neural network quantum states. Is this also the case or is just more always better um, in any case? So what, uh, what, how do we approach um, our comparison or study? Or, um, um, so what we do is we take um, a set of architectures. Um, there are, of course, many successful architectures. Uh, we just pick three of them. Um, and uh, look at a Hamiltonian um, that is very hard and try to, to study a bit what's going on. So what do we consider? Um, we take three architectures. The first one is the restricted Boltzmann machine, which is the first architecture to use um, for the variational energy optimization with neural network quantum states. Um, and we can understand it as a single layer uh, feed forward neural network with a specific activation function and skip connections. Um, second, we use group convolution neural networks because they have been very successful for frustrated models, uh, which basically, in a simplistic view, you can understand as a generalization of convolutional neural networks, but you can have other symmetries than, uh, point, uh, than, than translational symmetry. And third, uh, to have something that behaves a bit different, um, we compare with a recurrent neural network. Um, and in a recurrent neural network, um, the things are qualitatively a bit different because um, it has an autoregressive sampling property, meaning you can directly draw sample, samples from your neural network and there is no need um, to, to construct a Markov chain. So you will set, have a set of uncorrelated samples, um, which is qualitatively different to the other cases. Um, and what Hamiltonian do we choose? Uh, we tried one of the hardest things that you can do just to really be able to see problems, um, which is the uh, anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg model, J1, J2, on the triangular lattice. Um, why is it so hard? Because first of all, there is geometric frustration in the system because of the lattice. Um, and there would be, in theory, a classical Neal order, uh, which you see here with the spins. It's unstable due to quantum fluctuations. But secondly, there is also a frustration induced by this J2 term, which highly um, unstabilizes the, the, this Neal order. So it's kind of two-way frustrated, and uh, which is one of the reasons why this model is hard to solve accurately. And we're not trying to actually solve it accurately, we're just using it as a hard test case um, for our network ansatzes. So in general, if you're going to, if you say you're, you're trying to solve a problem and you have your neural network ansatz, you're going to face, be faced by two limitations computationally. One is the number of parameters that you can use, um, and second, the number of samples that you can uh, use for each batch or the total number of, uh, of samples that you see during optimization. So um, the first step that we, that we can take is um, to try to see just 
very simple. That's some, something that most people do when they, when they put their new network. How does the energy depend on the number of parameters and on the number of samples? So now for this particular model, we use RBM, RNN, and GCN, and now you should not compare the absolute values of the um, of this of these ansatzes, just the RBM and GCNN, um, because the RNN is, is taken for an open system that is a bit smaller, chosen such as the effective Hilbert space size of all of the three models is roughly equivalent, but it's not symmetrized. So um, it's just to see the trend, but not the absolute energies. Um, and what do we see? Well, um, it seems like um, um, if you increase the number of parameters, so this is like a log log plot, so you have to be careful with the um, um, with the slopes. Um, you do improve the ground state energy, but it flattens out quite a bit uh, if you go to a large number of parameters. And just to get the order of magnitude of this, the effective Hilbert space size for the model we're looking at for 24 spins with symmetries is about uh, 50,000, so it's about here. So even here, you already have more parameters than your, your total Hilbert space size, but the energy is still 10 to the minus three. Now you can make this better by including, for instance, more symmetries and by going to more elaborate ansatzes, but if you don't, and just blindly increase the number of parameters, that's what you get. So uh, um, it seems a bit that, you know, is it really the right solution to just blindly increase numbers, number of parameters and achieve over-parameterization in that way. Second, we can look at the same plot uh, as a number of samples. Um, and here, what you see is uh, samples per iteration, but the total number of iteration is fixed. So uh, it also sees uh, more samples. Meet all, more samples means both larger batch size and uh, more total samples. Um, um, in total. Um, and uh, interestingly, there is quite a strong dependence for the, both the RBM and the GCNN um, in training um, with more samples, uh, which seems more relevant here than increasing number of parameters even. Um, but the RNN does not depend on samples so much, which we don't have an explanation for. That's just what it seems to be. Um, this can either be good or bad for the RNN. You could say, okay, you know, then you can train your model for with a small number of samples um, and get to similar results. But if you're not able to improve it, that might also be a problem. Um, now, what we can do is we can compare this to uh, classical machine learning. Um, so what's trained here is a three-layer feedforward neural network on the task of uh, predicting the, the house market <laughs> values of the California housing market. Um, um, and uh, the problem that, uh, that you see on the right hand, well, the problem with the right hand side plot is that we didn't yet make the plot that we actually need to do, uh, which I'm going to explain on the left hand side. So what you see here, um, um, the upper plot is basically exactly the same experiment as on the right hand side, um, meaning increasing the batch size and keeping the total number of iteration fixed. So what's happening is that the model sees in total more samples, and also for the classical case, the loss value goes down and you get a better, um, you get a better prediction if you use a larger batch size. Now, the plot that we still need to make for the NKS case um, is looking at the dependence of the, of the batch size if you keep the total number of samples fixed, meaning if you have a small batch size, you train for more iterations. And then what you see classically is that mini batches help and the loss actually goes up if you increase the number of samples in your batch. So this we actually don't know yet. Um, we, we would uh, suspect that we see an opposite trend um, for the neural network quantum, uh, quantum states um, that mini batches might not help, but that's something that we don't understand yet. Um, but it's simple to try. We just didn't do the simulations yet. So. The next thing we can, we can try to do is to see a bit, to go a bit more deeper um, and look what happens during training um, and how does our landscape look um, um, during training. And what we do is like a bit similar approach than done in this paper, um, but uh, looking at the whole training trajectory and um, uh, for different, um, in a slightly different setup. So what we do is the following, we take, um, 
many random well, many is ten <laughs> random initializations of our uh, of our wave functions, um, um, and then just optimize these random initializations. And then what will happen is they will end up somewhere uh, in the next to the ground state. Uh, they might end up in the same minimum, they might end up in different minimum, that's something we want to probe and understand. Also, uh, they might take the same path or different paths through the optimization landscape. So the question we can ask here is whether are they all, the moment you have a slightly different initializations, do you separate in a different part of your optimization landscape um, and never see each other again, or is there some coming together at some point? Um, and how we probe that is we freeze a set of samples, uh, 8,000 samples, um, and uh, input the same samples through um, saved models during, during optimization. So we would like um, obtain for each point that we saved the model for 8,192 um, um, complex amplitudes that would correspond to one data point. Um, and basically, this is kind of a snapshot of how does the wave, wave function looks like, uh, but we cannot uh, put through an exponential number of samples, which is why we freeze a finite number of samples. Um, and then what we can do is to say, okay, let's have all these data points of the different trajectories during optimization. Um, let's just cluster them. And see um, and see how how the cluster looks like. So this is for a TCNN um, clustered using UMAP, um, and different trajectories corresponding to different random seeds are colored with different colors. Um, so what we see is kind of they tend to cluster somewhere else, um, and there are some that come together here and here. But generally, the trend is that to stay separated in optimization landscape. And uh, there are many questions one can ask here. Um, for instance, how these state physically differ? So is, are these clusters maybe separated by a different sign structure? Um, and is it maybe not possible to go from one to the other because it's hard to change the sign structure? Or is it some other uh, physical quantity that separates these clusters? Um, which is something that um, would be interesting for us to look at, but we didn't do that yet. Um, so, but in general, um, it seems like it's not a smooth, uh, trivial landscape with one uh, global uh, global minimum. But uh, it also means that yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I would say, like, I would say, you know, if you're truly overparameterized, and it's true, and if it's true that for neural network quantum states, overparameterization also means your landscape is smoother, um, then this would mean you're not overparameterized yet. Um, but we also don't know if it really means if you overparameterize, your landscape is smoother. So this is like not really well defined for NQS. Um, but I would say, yeah. So maybe NQS just. Uh, you cannot reach the overparameterized regime because this already has half the number of uh, parameters than your Hilbert spi uh, space uh, size. Um, we have tried it for the Heisenberg model triangular with uh, J2 equal to zero, um, but actually we have just tried it like for one model and uh, no conclusive results yet, so no. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah. That's something we would need to do. Yes. <laughs> um, what do you mean? Like this is a fixed sample and fixed parameter. Oh, oh, it's the, so I'm putting through the samples uh, and I get the, the wave function amplitude. So it's a wave function clustering. Um, my dear collaborator. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, all right, good. So um, what we can do next is to say, can we quantify this a bit more? So uh, maybe things are separated in the optimization landscape, but how rugged, if you want, does the landscape really look like if you're uh, close to the ground state? So what about the, the final states? 
Um, and for this, um, we can define a, this is not a very good, um, 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 let's say, order parameter for this, but it's a first order thing to do. Um, we can do the following. Let's just look at the variance of the final energies. So meaning uh, if you have many different final energies that differ from each other a lot, then your variance of the final energies of your optimizations um, will be higher than if you all go to the same minimum. Um, that's not a perfect pr uh, order parameter. You can th always think of uh, uh, the case that you might not be able to distinguish if you just um, go into two clusters uh, that are kind of far away or have many uh, distinct uh, things in one cluster, but we can do that as a first step and uh, plot the energies and see which of the cases we're actually looking at. Um, and what we can then further do is look at the dependence on the number of parameters and samples of this, of this thing. So before we do that, we have to understand what's happening. Um, and if you um, take your many uh, random initial seeds, what will happen if you just plot where things end up is that um, there will be a large cluster somewhere around the ground state um, and there will be a second smaller cluster for this particular case. There will be a second smaller cluster where things, I think they get stuck in an excited state um, um, or something. Um, and this you also see if you cluster the, just the final states. Now we have more points because we do this for a different number of parameters and samples. Um, or if you just scatter the, uh, the energies um, for one particular um, case of this, you see uh, there, is a, uh, there is a larger cluster where things end up close to the ground state. Um, and there is a smaller cluster above. I'm saying this because in order to look at this ruggedness, um, we, we, we can now differ, okay, how rugged is the landscape next to the ground state and how is it in total? Um, so we will just do this, this, uh, this variance uh, for both cases. Um, and this is what you see on the right-hand side as a function of parameters um, and as a function of samples. Um, and actually, you know, 10 random initializations is just too small to get uh, good um, statistics to, to look at both clusters together. So just ignore the, the black triangles and let's have a look at the, at the first cluster next to the ground state. So how rough is the landscape next to the ground state? And how does it depend on the number of parameters? And what we see is that it does smoothen out um, up to around here, which is kind of interestingly more or less the Hilbert space size. Um, but then increasing the number of parameters does not further smoothen out the landscape so much. Now, again, statistics are poor here. One has to do this with more initializations and so on and so on. But this is like an indication of a trend that we see in this plot. However, for the number of samples, kind of unsurprisingly, the landscape does smoothen out, uh, which makes a lot of sense because you just see it better and you might not think that you're stuck in a local minimum, which is actually not a local minimum. Um, so if you increase the number of samples, um, your, your variance of the final energies does decrease quite a bit and it seems to have a slope that goes on and on and it just wants you to increase the number of samples more. Um, so that's, a trend you see, um, and with respect to overparameterization, here he, you could also say, you know, maybe this is some flat plateau until, and you would need to increase the number of parameters further and further until you see a descent again. So, in order to um, understand uh, what's what's going on a bit, um, why does it get so much smoother with uh, increasing number of samples? Um, a a simple thing to do is to just uh, consider, okay, how well do we actually approximate the gradient um, in each iteration? So what we can do is we can, um, we can so, you know, we do, we do stochastic reconfiguration or MinSR and we follow, we follow the gradient effectively um, with some metric of the, of the, um, of the uh, neural network space. Um, but so it's important to, in each step, be able to actually follow the correct gradient. Um, and however, we use a finite number of Monte Carlo samples to estimate that gradient, which will um, probably, um, um, which will introduce an offset with respect to the exact gradient. And secondly, there also have, has been a recent paper on 
um, there being a bias in estimating the gradient because you sample from the wave function um, and not from the actual gradient. So you might imagine that there are the wave function has a lot of zeros or something um, um, where your gradient is non-zero but your wave function is zero and then you miss these samples during, um, during training. Um, here we are not there yet, so all, all that we do is look at the sample dependence um, and look at the overlap of the sampled gradient with an exact gradient. And the smaller the overlap, the, the worse we're doing. So you could imagine that you're maybe um, close to some minimum, the exact gradient points towards this minimum, but maybe your sampled gradient is so bad that you accidentally uh, go somewhere else or get stuck in moving around here. And what we can do is look at this as a function of training iterations. So here, um, this is uh, the same GCNN that I clustered before. Um, and at zero iteration, um, I'm plotting the gradient overlap with the exact gradient um, as a function of samples um, that I'm using. And there, all seems good. Even for almost no samples, your overlap is basically one. So you go somewhere in the right direction. However, when you start training, um, this gets worse, so that at, at 100 iterations, you already need quite a bit of, of um, um, Hilbert space size um, fraction to get a more or less accurate gradient overlap, and this continues if you, if you go to larger training iterations. So it means you go through some regime in your, in your training landscape where suddenly you need a lot of, 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 of samples to accurately estimate your gradient overlap. Um, which means that what you can think of happening uh, is that uh, the variance of the energies, uh, if you take many random initial seeds, is high because um, you just don't realize that you're actually close to a local minimum or you think you're in a, uh, in a local minimum when, when you actually don't and there is a cliff next to you that you just don't see. Um, next, there is a second quantity uh, that can tell us a bit more about, um, about the structure of the landscape, um, which is the quantum geometric tensor. So what's that? Um, we can understand this in terms of distances in our parameter space. So let's say we have all our neural network uh, uh, parameters um, and we want to, typically if you say, okay, we have all our neural network parameters for one ansatz and then we have a second ansatz, what's the distance between them? Well, we can just take the Euclidean distance of the parameters. Now, this might not directly translate into the distance of the actual wave functions that these parameters um, um, lead to. So the wave functions, you know, go into neural network, this outputs a wave function amplitude, but how do the two states of, with the two parameter sets differ? Um, and in the Hilbert space then, we do have measures to quantify distances typically related to the fidelity between two states. So one uh, common metric that people like to use is the Fubini study distance, which is the, just the arc cosine of the fidelity between the two wave functions. Uh, meaning um, if it's low, then uh, the fidelity is high um, and the states are close to each other and vice versa. Um, and with this understanding, we can define a metric, an infin infinitesimal uh, metric tensor. So we want to translate an infinitesimal variation in parameter space to a variation in Hilbert space. Um, and, you know, we can just write down uh, this infinitesimal variation in Hilbert space um, and get this uh, metric tensor, which we call quantum geometric tensor or correlation matrix or covariance matrix, um, whatever you like. Uh, and this is also the same tensor that you use during stochastic reconfiguration, uh, optimizing, optimizing your wave function. So this actually is not only relevant to characterize your landscape, but also, yes. Stochastic reconfiguration, yes. Um, so, right, and this, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. So what we actually should do is not is not uh, compare the, the the just the plane gradient, but we should co should compare s to the minus one gradient. Absolutely, hundred percent agree. We just didn't do it yet. <laughs> um, right. So <laughs> so so basically, um, but what we can do uh, in the meantime um, is have a look at this at this object, the quantum geometric tensor itself. 
uh, because it will tell us something about what are the relevant directions uh, in my, in my um, parameter space. So one thing that one can do is um, look at the rank of this object, the quantum geometric tensor. Um, what does it mean? Well, the rank of this object would tell us how many relevant directions can I take in parameter space that would actually lead to a difference in my wave function. So if it's very small, it means I have a lot of redundant directions um, in, my, in, my, in my parameterization, and uh, I might increase the number of parameters and just add redundant directions. So first of all, we can look at it as a function of samples. Now, the rank is strictly bound by the number of samples, so it will always be smaller or equal than the number of samples that you use to estimate it. Um, but interestingly, it's also, it seems so, here you see the rank as a, uh, divided by the number of parameters, so this diagonal thing uh, would correspond to the strict bound by the number of samples. But um, interestingly, while you do increase the rank with number of samples, you also stay maybe a bit flat um, and are quite below this, this strict bound that you have by, as a number of parameters for this model. If you go to larger system sizes, this uh, gets a bit, you use more relevant parameters, but uh, for this particular model where even the energy is not very good, uh, this does not seem to be the case. Um, so one can think, uh, one can think of this as, uh, you know, if the, if the, if the rank of the geometric tensor is, is very small, then you might not see the, the curvature of your landscape um, accurately. Um, now this is something that, um, another thing that has been done in this paper for the case of an RBM for a small system is look at a dependence of the rank as a function of parameters. Um, what does it mean? Well, if the rank, so here we see the rank as a number of parameters plotted for the GCNN and the RBM, and we see that there seems to be some critical number of parameters at which the rank flattens out, meaning if you increase the number of parameters, you don't seem to add relevant directions to your wave function. That's not completely clear, there would be more studies to do, uh, one would have to do to see what actually happens when you increase the number of parameters because it's not a fair comparison, but there seems to be a trend that maybe, um, maybe what happens is that you're able to fully parameterize one part of your wave function, maybe the amplitudes, but if you increase the number of parameters blindly, some other part of physics you don't capture at all and it's not the right direction to do. Um, so, this basically calls for maybe more, uh, yes? Um, yes, this was, uh, so for the, for the, for the, um, for the correlation matrix it was larger than, uh, than the rank of the, of the S matrix. It was like 50,000, yeah. Um, okay, so it means basically, uh, many open questions. There seems to be um, a dependence of the rank of the geometric tensor with number of samples and of number of parameters, but it's not clear to which point you can keep adding relevant directions. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, no, this is why I'm also saying um, that this is not complete yet. So what we do here is only look at the final, uh, the final state and compare the rank of that. So if we increase the number of parameters, then we re-optimize and look at the final rank. So it's to me also not clear yet whether this really means that you're not adding relevant directions because what you, it's hard to, it's hard to make this uh, comparison, right? Because if you take an ansatz and then you just add parameters and zeros, um, that might also not be the right way to add around the back, like, you know, what I mean, yeah. So it's, it's a bit hard comparison to make. Yes? Yes, yes. So this seems related, yeah. Okay, so I think with this I can come to my summary. Um, now there are many, many red marks here because we have many open questions. Um, what we looked at is at the dependence of a number of samples and parameters of uh, certain quantities in the landscape. Um, and what we saw is that if you increase the number of samples and parameters, in general, the ruggedness of the landscape will decrease. Um, um, trajectories cluster, seem to cluster in the landscape. 
um, and there is a, is, a, is a very crucial dependence on the, on the gradient overlap in the QGT rank as a number of samples. Um, now, there are many open questions. For instance, what about batch size versus epochs? Um, how does the choice of sampling matter? Uh, do you need to introduce sampling if you, if you want to sample the gradient that is not from the wave function? Um, um, it is also not clear that whether we are able to reach an overparameterized regime and what it actually means for new network quantum states uh, and how these results scale with larger system sizes if you use, uh, for instance, help the network with the Marshall sign rule, uh, change the choice of Hamiltonian, and so on. But um, yeah, I, I hope this can maybe lead to some discussion. Um, and thank you very much for your attention and please feel free to ask questions. Thanks a lot, Agnes, for the really nice presentation. So there were already a few questions, but we still have time for a few more. Hi, thank you very much for this interesting talk. So I have a question because you raised it actually, what are the differences in the different ground states found? So, and because you, you linked it to somehow the uh, quantum geometric tensor in the end, because if you think of the quantum geometric tensor from a topological side of view, you can link it to topological properties of the state. Have you studied also like uh, topological models, I would say, and, and, and how, how they maybe Maybe you can link like these topological properties to the to the quantum geometric tensor and then back to the oh. NQS. Um, that sounds very interesting. Thank you for the input. No, we have not done that, but I mean there are topological models that t people typically t study with NQS um, that we can try. Um, but I mean for the yeah, we have we have not looked at any of that way uh, of that things. But yeah, no, it's an interesting question you raise. Thank you. Very nice talk, thank you. So I was a bit curious how you increase the number of parameters because you could increase it by just increasing, you fix the layer, you increase the number of neurons or you basically make the neuron deeper, the, your neural network deeper and then they have different scalings. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, for, the, for the GCNN, um, what we did is, I tried a bit, we tried a bit around with uh, increasing the, the size of the, of the layers and increasing the size of the network. Um, right now, these plots increase along the diagonal, both, uh, f uh, both uh, layer size and um, number of layers, um, um, which seems to indicate it be the most useful direction, but we have not fully explored this yet. So there might be indeed a very different scaling. Now you can understand the RBM as a one, an extreme case of that, right? You have one layer and then you just increase the size of the layer. Uh, and it seems to be from the plot that the RBM, in terms of scaling, behaves kind of similar as the GCNN. Um, so maybe, yeah, I'm actually not sure, yeah. But uh, we, we did these two cases, diagonal and one layer. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the nice talk. Um, in all the plots that you showed, the RNN was significantly, significantly different than the other two architectures that you were considering. Do you think this is, the reason is the autoregressive property or do you have any idea what's going differently there? Yeah, um, no, that's a great question. I mean, so the RNN is also very different in its parameterization, right? Because what it does is, is you have to you have the sequential correlation with, with your former um, spin neighbor. Um, so it's very different in how, in how you parameterize. Um, and uh, yeah, we talked a lot about this with Juan Carlos Lias group, who are the RNN experts. <laughs> and it's, it's a very curious question because there are also things like, oh, what I didn't mention is that the RNN is not trained with uh, stochastic reconfiguration because it's much worse if you train it with stochastic reconfiguration, as you may know. Um, um, but it's trained using Adam. Um, and uh, it's not clear why this is the case. 
uh, it may be that you just have many redundant parameters in your RNN and the parameterization is just not efficient in that way, so you would need to come up maybe with a more physical motivation of that. Um, but maybe it's also related to autoregressive sampling. That's something that's very open um, and an own research project, <laughs> I think, on its own. Yeah. Thanks. Ask quick questions. Hi, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, clearly, you have used a pretty challenging network, which I understand was very much the point of the whole endeavor. But what I wonder is, um, have you perhaps investigated the ruggedness of the learning landscape with respect to the variance of the of the wave function amplitudes? So say, you have a very small variance, perhaps it's very it's easier, so it is proportional to that. Have you looked at that in any way? Oh, I see. Um, no, we have not. It's interesting to look at. Also, the question, I guess, would be, um, you know, maybe the variance of the wave function amplitude of your final state is that way, is, you know, has, like, has a very small variance or has a very high variance, but maybe you still need to pass through a high variance or small variance part in your optimization landscape. So there is a paper um, by um, Cheyun Park, I think, that, that uh, where they find that you do go through a point in optimization landscape for, I don't remember which Hamiltonians they look at, quite a lot of uh, Hamiltonians, you do go through a point in optimization landscape where you have like a fat tail in your wave function, even though your final wave function might look different. Um, so I agree, like that's a very interesting thing to, to look at. So, as you pointed out correctly in the beginning, I mean, the main difference uh, between this and supervised learning that is that you don't have a training set uh, and you generate it on the fly via Marco C. Monte Carlo, basically. So, I mean, I don't really understand, but maybe it's a, a, an open question, like how do you define the over-parameterized regime in this context? Because, I mean, usually it's like you have a fixed training set, set uh, um, size and you compare this uh, with yeah. uh, the number of weights and biases in their network, why here it's not clear. And also concerning the batch size, I mean, even in that case, it's not really clear how to compare with the number of training data, right? Yeah, uh, great question. I think that's exactly the point. So um, it's yeah, not... I didn't have any idea, I mean, that you um, I mean, so it seems like, so, I mean, in classical machine learning, right, you would do a number of total training set size times number of uh, output classes, and this would be kind of your number of parameters after which you start being over-parameterized. Um, here, it seems like we don't really reach an over-parameterized regime. We're even larger than the Hibbert space size. So you could say, you know, uh, the Hibbert space size could be it. You just need to see all the samples and you know, maybe this gradient points a bit in the wrong direction, but this will point in the other direction, it will go down. But that's not clear. But I'm, I'm actually not sure if it would be that if you have a wave function with maybe a, um, um, not a fat tail and just being like yeah, this. Yeah, the localization of the wave function maybe, yes, right? Yes, exactly. So maybe that would be a relevant set of samples. This is something we, I just opened this question, I didn't answer it. <laughs> one, one quick comment uh, related to this. So. Uh, you're right, but in some sense, you know, with MQS, the situation is very much like what you have in reinforcement learning, where uh, you also have like a policy, and the policy generates samples itself, and then you use these samples to update the policy, right? And in, 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 in this setup, typically when people talk about um, over-parameterization, then um, what they believe is that, that there are multiple ways to reach, in this case, the ground state. So there would be like various configurations of the weights and biases that are distinct and that can give you uh, the ground state. So in other words, you can have many ways to parameterize the same physical state um, with, the, uh, with the architecture. So that would still be like a, a form of, of over-parameterization. So in some sense, you have the bottom of the landscape and then you can reach that bottom uh, along various paths. But it's not always the same bottom. So it's the same physical state but could be different uh, weights and biases. Right, so let's thank the speaker again.